Technology Podcast. Uh, this is one of your regular hosts, Neil Ford. And I'm another one of your regular hosts, Rebecca Parsons. And generally on the podcast, we have guests who are thought workers who have uh, interesting things to talk about. But today it's just me and Rebecca because we have something interesting to talk about. So we we do not preclude the possibility of just having a, a podcast host to talk about something that they are particularly interested in or have some perspectives on. And that is definitely the case today. Uh, Rebecca and I are both uh, quite passionate about this subject of uh, programming languages in general and some perspectives on that. That, uh, very specifically. When uh, we were chatting about podcast topics, uh, one of the topics that I thought about that I've been uh, talking about for years uh, was this realization that I made several years ago. This is back when I was writing my book about uh, in functional thinking that uh, the, there is no real true one programming language to rule them all, even though a lot of developers seem to be chasing that. And there are lots of interesting reasons why that is. So I'll start this by a famous quote from uh, William Faulkner, who was a, a Nobel Prize winning author. And he very famously has a quote that says, uh, uh, I'm a failed poet. He said, I tried to write poetry and I was really bad at it. So then I tried to write short stories and I was really bad at that. So I guess I'm a novelist. And the point of that quote is that I believe that programming languages are a creative medium. It's, it's interesting because it's both a creative medium and it's an engineering medium, uh, which makes it makes programming one of those interesting things. I think it was, uh, uh, who was it that uh, said, uh, was it Fred Brooks that said uh, programming is like a building castles in the sky? or some uh, really eloquent thing like that. Programming languages are a creative medium, and I think one of the things you have to do as a programmer is find the programming language that most facilitates you being creative but doesn't annoy you and get in your way uh, by putting too many roadblocks in front of that creativity. Well, and one of the things that that I think is important in, in that context, too, is different programming languages have different underpinning characteristics. What are the fundamental building blocks that you use within the language to build up a particular program? And when I think about programming, I think about what are the things that I am trying to represent in the world? And similarly, what are the constructs and what are the the fundamental building blocks that that programming language makes available to me? And I want to match those. And again, I, I, I agree completely, Neil, that uh, there is never going to be one true programming language to rule them all because the kinds of problems we're trying to solve are so broad. And the only way you could get one true language to rule them all, it, it would have to be a kitchen sink language. Like, unfortunately, C++, which has a little bit of object and a little bit of C and a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And I've heard, you know, similar things about Scala, where there's too much of a mixing of the paradigms uh, within the language. But there's a reason we have different kinds of languages, and it's because we have different kinds of problems and, uh, and people think in different kinds of ways. Yeah, I think uh, one of our colleagues, actually, I wished I had uh, come up with this quote, but one of our colleagues, and I can't even remember who it was, said that uh, they thought that one of the problems in Scala was that it was too flexible, that it was flexible in too many ways. And it's very much a philosophy, very much like C++ of let's support all the paradigms and then let developers choose which paradigm they want to pick, you know, which path they want to go today. And that can be very empowering for exactly the reason you're talking about, because it allows you to very tightly, uh, you know, build the language toward the exact problem you're working on. But it also requires incredible discipline if you have a large programming team, because one of the dysfunctions I've seen on Scala projects is that some people are coding in an object-oriented style, and some are coding in a functional style, and some are doing their own, you know, wacky thing with uh, a lot of metaprogramming and other powerful facilities, and they're writing in their own language they've created, uh, and it becomes very, very difficult to understand. And of course, it's a creative medium where, uh, and you know, one of the other interesting things about uh, programming languages is that it's a creative medium, but other people have to read what you've created 
toward a clarity. You know, clarity is one of the, the primary goals of being able to read code and being able to create really readable code in, in a particular language is, uh, you know, its own challenge sometimes. Well, and also there are different people who conceive of solutions to problems in different ways. Um, and I think that complicates it as, as well, um, getting to the clarity point uh, that, that you talk about. One of the most frightening pieces of code I've ever laid eyes on uh, was written by someone who was an excellent Fortran programmer, but that was the only language he had ever programmed in. And he thought in terms of problem solution very much in the, in the Fortran imperative style. Um, but he went to an organization that wanted to use Lisp. And so he wrote Fortran programs in Lisp's syntax. He could understand the syntax of Lisp and he knew what he had to do to get his Fortran program to work in the Lisp programming language. Uh, but he never really grasped what Lisp, Lisp was all about. Um, and therefore, he literally wrote Fortran programs in Lisp syntax. Um, now, now, that's obviously an extreme case, but I think it does get back to what you're talking about, both in terms of, of the problems with these kitchen sink languages on large teams. Different people are going to think about how to solve the problem differently. And if you have someone who is thinking object oriented, he's going to and, and the language supports both functional and object oriented styles, he is going to approach looking at that problem and looking at the code and trying to interpret it as OO code, even if it's maybe actually more calling on the functional uh, characteristics of Scala. And that is just going to increase the, the dissonance. It's sort of like, you know, looking at a piece of text and expecting to see English and actually it's filled with Latin phrases. You don't, even if you know Latin, if you're going in expecting to read English, it's going to take a moment to, to make that shift and say, ah, actually, no, this isn't how it's, it's, it's intended. Well, and there are two interesting things about that because it, it goes way down all the way to the fundamental levels of the language, uh, what you're talking about. Because when you think in an object-oriented way, you think iteration. But when you think in a functional way, you think map reduce. And, and those are fundamentally different ways to attack a problem that, you know, gets below the level of, you know, uh, all the other uh, things you have to consider about the problem. And so, you know, it's the beginning phase of the solution, not the last little bit of solving a problem because it's a fundamental way of, of thinking about it um, and and the other thing is you know this is always and everybody who is listening to this is programmed in more than one programming language just knows that you know you always pick up a new programming language by programming in it in the old style exactly like your uh, your exemplar there because I know when I first started coding in uh, Ruby, I was very much writing Java code in Ruby, and then I gradually learned the idioms of Ruby, but and I think this is one of the huge benefits of embracing uh, being a polyglot programmer and knowing many programming languages. Inevitably, learning a new language and learning its idioms makes you better in whatever language that you happen to be in. Exactly, and it's one of the reasons why I think in learning a language, you should start from what are the fundamental semantic constructs? The, the, the syntax is, is how you express it. It's learning first, what are those fundamental building blocks? What are the constructs that I have to build up my program? And what are the uh, idioms, as you say? What, what, what are the organizing principles that I'm going to use to construct this? And then you learn the syntax. And then eventually, if you learn enough languages within the same family, then you can start to really delve into what are the differences between OO programs expressed in Smalltalk versus Java versus C Sharp versus C++, you know, as, as examples. I mean, how are those expressed differently? And then you can start to sort of tease apart the subtleties of different language decisions. For so long, we've had very dominant languages. First, it was Fortran, 
actually first it was Assembler, but then it was Fortran and then COBOL, you know, COBOL was everywhere. And still. You know. <laughs> I, exactly. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, you had C as kind of the systems language. But when I look at the language landscape now, it is so much richer with languages like Golang um, and Rust and Julia, this entire pr- proliferation. And, you know, I have my own theories, but I, I, I wonder, Neil, why do you think we are seeing this? Um, explosion in the availability of different kinds of languages that that are not just toy languages. You know, they're not just used kind of on the edges, but but actually getting serious consideration. I think there's a, a couple of things around that. Part of it is uh, the maturity of people understanding how programming languages work and what they're useful for. So language design has gone in leaps and bounds, particularly, you know, the one of the benefits of Java and its ecosystem is this, you know, the way they've been studying uh, both uh, the idea of, of the underlying machinery, the virtual machine, and then language design. And they've actually done a really good job. And of course, C-sharp added to that. But I think just in general, there's a much richer ecosystem of languages. But I think, too, that they're much uh, smarter languages now because... And this is one of the points that I wanted to make, and this makes it easy to circle back to. One of the things that you and I called out in the Building Evolution Architectures book was uh, the 4GL languages that were all the rage back in the 1990s. There was a Cambrian explosion of these 4GL languages back then with uh, DBase and FoxPro and Clipper and Access and Paradox. And there was this whole family power builder. It was a huge dominant force for years in the industry. But it goes exactly the thing that you were saying before, the building blocks part of the programming language, that those building blocks were too, the building blocks are too coarse grain. They were too chunky. And this is what we codified as the last 10% trap, which I always, I use access as the problem child here, but it's true for all these four GLs that uh, when you build something in access, you know, you can get about 80% of what you want really fast and easy. And the next 10% is possible with some difficulty, but that last 10% is always out of your reach. And so that's why we always go back to general purpose programming languages. Uh, and and towards your point about modern languages, they haven't, for the most part, fallen into that trap. If you look at Golang and Rust and Closure and Scala, those are all very general purpose programming languages, but with a very distinct philosophy behind them. So I think as we learn more about programming languages, we learn, you know, what things create really, truly uh, uh, capable blank canvases versus the ones that are useful for limited problems, but then uh, quickly uh, run out of steam. And of course, the current incarnation of that is the low code environment stuff that you see popping up. That's just fourth generation languages reborn yet again. And I ex- expect the same fate for those environments. Exactly. And and one of the things um, that uh, Martin and I were trying to get at with the domain specific languages book addresses that same kind of, you know, uh, 80-20 trap. People in the past when they've tried to write and design these domain-specific languages have fallen into that same kind of trap where, okay, I can I can think about 80% of my problem this way, but then I need a notion of iteration um, and I need a notion of this and a notion of that. And so they build into their domain specific language, these general purpose programming language constructs, and then the entire thing blows up. And, you know, trying to look at this is rather than allow that to happen, think about from the perspective of your domain, why do you need this concept of iteration? You know, perhaps it is, something more along a MapReduce style, but you can create constructs that don't replicate the general purpose capability of iteration, but give you, gives you the semantically relevant iteration that you need within the context of, of that domain. And I think that's one of the uh, problems, again, that the low-code environments are, are going to run up against is 
where do you draw that boundary? And um, I've I've heard many of the things that we've heard for years about gener- uh, generators and automatic code translators. And well, but you can always just have it generate source code and fiddle with it from there. And it's like, well, A, that kind of defeats the purpose of having a more simplified programming environment in this low code environment. And B, is that code in any way, shape, or form maintainable in that new state? Fundamentally, all languages, if you have a few basic constructs, they can all do everything. It's just how much work and how much complexity are you introducing to try to do something that a language just really isn't well suited for. Back to my Fortran program written in the Lisp example. <laughs> In fact, if I remember correctly, one of the things you called out in the DSL book were DSLs that were too ambitious, that were creeping too far toward Turing completeness, which is an anti-pattern in that space. Exactly, exactly. And going back to your point, too, about language design, one of the problems that we have when we think about domain-specific languages is it's outside of a few very basic design principles, I don't think we have yet a shared understanding of what constitutes a good domain-specific language. And it's conceivable that there is not a general definition of what constitutes a good domain-specific language outside the bounds of things like don't be overambitious, you know, have a well-defined domain, all of that sort of thing. But we have gotten much more sophisticated in what constitutes good language design from a general purpose programming language uh, position and you know, even more so what does a good OO language look like versus what does a good functional language look like uh, or what a good declarative language looks like. Um, so I, I, I agree we have gotten a lot more, more so sophisticated. Um, the, the other part of my hypothesis on, on why more of these languages are, are coming into being, uh, I do think the computational viability of um, of the bytecode interpretation uh, is, is a big part of that. Um, and the decision by both um, Sun and then Oracle and Microsoft in thinking about the JVM and the CLR respectively as a language implementation platform, has made a big difference because the, the it significantly reduces the barrier uh, to implement a new programming language because you don't have to do all of the stuff around compilation, um, optimization, getting down to you know what's going to run on the hardware. You just have to take it down to the point of you know. The, the JVM language or the, or the CLR language. So I, I, I do think the implementation simplicity or the reduction in difficulty of language implementation, um, I, I think is, is important. It's, it's certainly not simple even going to, you know, a platform like the JVM to implement a new language, but it's certainly easier than, um, than it has been in the past. Yeah, and I think that speaks exactly to your point about evolution as well, because the code generator thing you were talking about, uh, Power Builder back in the day, which is a very popular 4GL, uh, when it was on its last legs, it was an interpreted language back when you know interpreters weren't that powerful because machinery wasn't that powerful. So in the last gasp of relevance in Power Builder, what they started doing was code genning all the Power Builder code into C code and then handing that to a C compiler to compile it as the optimization step. And for exactly the reasons you were talking about, that was a nightmare because uh, you take that generated C code and it was incomprehensible, but there were some things that you had to go tweak in that. And of course, as soon as you tweak that, you couldn't go backwards. And so what you ended up with was a, a massively generated, unmaintainable C code base. But by that split, and I think the split uh, that they made when they designed the Java Virtual Machine, they managed to cleave it in a, such a useful place or between this kind of fundamental uh, 
uh, operations and behavior that a programming language needs versus the syntax that produces that behavior has proved to be incredibly fruitful in our industry because it has allowed this explosion of languages for, you know, uh, really sophisticated languages that can actually compete as first class languages uh, because they can rely on the underlying garbage collection and performance and all the other tuning that they do on a regular basis on those underlying virtual machines. I also do think uh, another uh, another aspect of computation today that is uh, is feeding the uh, this expansion of of the programming language landscape is we are solving a much broader range of problems um, than than we used to. I mean, back when I was studying, you had two classes of programs. You had business programs that were written in COBOL, and then you had scientific programs that were written in Fortran. And those communities never really interacted very much. They, they, they solved very different kinds of problems. And, you know, the fundamental languages were quite different between those. When you start to think about implementing on a mobile device, uh, implementing a, a, uh, rich, immersive user experience, but also dealing with embedded computation in cars um, or in, in a, you know, networks of, of uh, IoT devices. There, there's a, a, a real breadth to that, that landscape of problem types and how how you might want to approach those problems and also the illities related to it. You know, you, you will think about um, uh, memory utilization or power utilization or um, code footprint in a very different way if you're running on, um, on a desktop versus running on a, um, an IoT device that's sitting out somewhere in the middle of a field. Yeah, and, and the capabilities of these tiny platforms is amazing too. I mean, you can run, reasonably run, you know, high level Java code on like a Raspberry Pi now, where, you know, a, a, few, a few years ago, you would have had to write an assembly language to write and target a platform that, that, uh, that compact. So uh, just the, the, uh, the rising tide of hardware capabilities has made our, our job as programmers a lot more convenient. So, shall we speculate a little bit? Where, sure. Where's the uh, where, where, if at all, do you see a gap in the landscape of languages? That's a really interesting question because you know the new languages that have come out uh, are uh, opinionated, uh, but don't always pick up on a lot of the things uh, that other well-established languages have been doing. So Rust is a good example of one that has chosen a very, very, you know, we want to replace C kind of perspective of very low-level kinds of system programming. Go language is designed for these, you know, very small little command line utilities, and and they purposely left some things out uh, around a uh, concurrency that you know modern java is currently do around deadlock prevention and that kind of stuff and and some things like uh, support for some of the data structures like generics so that because they wanted to keep things uh, quite simple so i think that kind of opinionated language design will continue and i think we'll see some interesting uh, perspectives on that uh, going forward. Um, I think that, you know, the as you were talking about, the fundamental capabilities that we're seeing are going to keep spawning new ways to be able to write stuff. So I think very soon you'll be able to write in a very high level language and easily target some environment like a watch or, you know, IoT device and not have to worry about a lot of the things you have to worry about now. I think connectivity uh, like Bluetooth will get much better uh, over time and we can stop thinking about locality quite so much. And of course, the uh, the idea of cloud and resources like memory, uh, you know, is becoming a fuzzier and fuzzier concept on desktop applications. I think that's going to continue going down. Um, 
And, you know, we can see a day where uh, we're actually starting to see this, where, you know, everything with electricity also has an IP address. So the reach that you can have with uh, programs, I think, is going to be astounding. And I think one of the, the interesting things is going to be how do we take all these different programming languages, technology stacks, platforms, but they all have an IP address, and we all want to get them to talk to one another and do useful stuff. So I think there's going to be some interesting challenges in integration architecture, maybe even some languages targeted purely at kind of integrating all the stuff together. We're still writing things at a very low level right now, but you know it would be really nice to have a higher level programming language that allows you to wire together you know, your Alexa and your HomePod and your phone and your washing machine to do some sort of useful thing. Uh, while the capability is technically there right now, we just haven't invented the language yet to get those things to easily talk to one another. Yeah, that was the same direction I, I was going where, where you got to toward towards the end is a language that a, a high level, higher level language that allows the, the proper modeling of distributed computation. When we think about microservices, when we think about IoT uh, d devices, when we think about these kinds of ecosystems, um, although I'm not sure about my washing machine, and I certainly don't, ha I still have never figured out why I would want an IP address on a toaster. But yeah, I'm, I'm sure that's just my, my limited thinking. Um, but, but I do think um, some higher level constructs that help us more properly express the communication um, and coordination aspects of distributed computation and to allow an easier way to express some of those uh, some of those notions of, of distributed systems and solve some of the problems that are inherent as soon as you start to run across uh, a network of, of distributed devices and are even more complicated as the uh, as the devices become more heterogeneous. Yeah, in fact, uh, my sous vide has an, uh, an IP address, and uh, it is actually useful because it tells me when things are done. And in fact, I've even played around a little bit toward what I was talking about before. There are some utilities like if this, then that, that you can do things on your phone to say things like when the sous vide has been cooking for four hours, uh, notify me that it's done and start the toaster because I need to start the rest of dinner. So, you know, we are starting to see some very rudimentary ways of uh, wiring things together. But it's you know very, very, very primitive and very uh, reminds me of uh, you know the early days of assembly language. Now, so I think we'll eventually get to a much more interesting place with those kind of things. And it is certainly far more satisfying to do programming that that makes changes in in the real world and that just generates a number or spits out a report. Yeah, it's certainly more fun to see, you know, uh, click a button on your phone and watch something in the real world uh, react to it is, is always a, a real treat. <laughs> So we'll, we'll uh, wrap up here. So, uh, you know, the premise of this uh, podcast was that there is no uh, one true programming language, but we're both kind of language geeks. And so I feel compelled to, because uh, I get this question a lot, because, you know, one of my hobbies has kind of been looking at programming languages, and I've always been interested. And one of the questions people always ask me is, well, you know a lot of programming languages. Do you have a favorite? And in fact, I do have two favorites uh, for different purposes. Um, Ruby is still my all-time favorite programming language for getting little stuff done because it is so developer-friendly. In fact, what I say is it's so developer-friendly that it's dangerous because it's so friendly it will let you do really, really dumb things because it's trying to be as friendly and as accommodating as possible. So I still write a lot of Ruby. I still use rake files, the make utility in Ruby, to do all kinds of things on my machine uh, uh, to automate all kinds of tasks. But for really serious work, you know, I've I looked at C++, I spent many years programming in C++, and I've looked at uh, deeply at a lot of other programming languages, but I think I've come around to the, my favorite one. If I had choice, which you never do, of course, but if I had my sole choice for programming language on a project, I think it would probably end up being 
closure because of the reasons we talked about the JVM earlier. You get all that first class support. But I really like the perspective that closure has, which is kind of the opposite of the one that Scala had. Uh, like Go, it's a very opinionated language uh, by Rich Hickey, the language designer. And I have a deep abiding love for Lisp anyway. Uh, and it is a Lisp uh, because... And one of the things I like most about Lisp uh, is that uh, unlike a Scala or a language or even a Ruby that gives you a million different ways to extend it, there's basically one way to extend a Lisp, and it's the macro facility. And everything you look at is either a thing or it's a macro on a thing. And so it has a very, very well-defined extension mechanism. And I think that long-term leads to better readability and understandability. Now, I have to bend your mind around to understand the notation of lists, but one of the things that I like about it, and the reason I say that I think it's one of the better engineering languages is because there's no ambiguity when you read that code, whereas there is very often the opportunity for ambiguity in other languages, and sometimes egregious ambiguity in really powerful languages that let you rewrite every part of it, uh, you start mistrusting what you are seeing. Uh, and so I really like that combination of things in uh, closure, the opinionation, and uh, the the single paradigm approach that still supports others, but definitely leans into one opinion about how to do things correctly. I'm sure Rich Hickey will be pleased. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Well, and I know you have a deep abiding love for the uh, the scheme and the Lisp family of uh, languages as well. Yes, we, we should probably not get into the Lisp versus scheme debate, but... Um, yes. Um, I, I do tend more towards the, the, the scheme side of the fence, but for, for many of the, the reasons that, that you stated for your, your uh, fondness for closure, um, that all transfers from scheme just as readily as it, as it transfers from, from, from Lisp. And I, I guess I had the most fun programming actually in C, um, which I know, you know, most people would would find her horrendous, and and I'm I'm still looking for a language that gives me the the freedom of C without at least, but also getting rid of some of the landmines that were so easy. I was programming when when I was doing a lot of this this programming, I was programming by myself. So solving problems and I didn't have to worry about, you know, what other people were going to be doing with the code because it was solving, you know, particular problems for me. And I was in a position, therefore, that I could maintain the discipline that so often has people, you know, in, in a language like C or Ruby, as, as you described, it can all go horribly wrong if you have people with different sets of disciplines uh, trying to ma maintain the same code base. But I guess that makes me very old fashioned. <laughs> no, I do have a great fondness for C, not C++, which I think is kind of a train wreck. Uh, but C, K and R C was a beautiful language because it they managed to hit just the right level of, you know, higher than assembly language, but lower level uh, or, or, or low level enough to write, you know, really astoundingly performant things. And, you know, as much as people badmouth C, uh, most of the code we're running right now is still written in C. You know, Unix is fundamentally still written in C. And then, of course, everything is now running some flavor of Unix. And uh, Windows is still largely written in C and C++, I suspect. So um, I, I thought that was a beautiful language. And, you know, I think one of the things that really helped C out tremendously was that original K&R book about C because it, it was... I think secondarily a reference on C programming, but primarily a guide on how to program in C idiomatically. And that was a brilliant because it really showed people how to think in C in a way that I think very few introductory books of a programming language have ever managed to do. All right, so that's uh, Rebecca and I uh, geeking out about uh, programming languages. So to the small subset of people who enjoyed that, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, the others probably turned this podcast off a bit earlier. So, uh, But uh, certainly something that uh, uh, she and I are interested in. So uh, thanks very much for listening uh, and I hope you enjoyed it and uh, come back for our next episode.